Hello, bonjour tout le monde. Donc, nous sommes très honorés de, faire, donc, de démarrer cette première conférence du cycle de conférence et dossier sous PPA. Et donc, avant de, de présenter formellement et, la, la, la conférence, je voudrais juste donner quelques éléments que vous voyez déjà sur votre, vos, vos écrans. Donc, pardon, c'est pas celui-là. Voilà, avant de démarrer la conférence, donc quelques éléments supplémentaires. Et on voudrait juste faire un point sur, sur EDOC et sur PPA et sur quelques points importants hein, que nous voudrions partager avec vous. Un premier élément euh, qui nous semble très intéressant, c'est de, de parler avec vous sur les résultats de la nuit euh, du défi étudiant qui a eu lieu euh, la semaine dernière, donc euh, sur laquelle nous avons eu la possibilité de faire participer une communauté importante de nos étudiants à, à cette nuit de défi. Et donc nous avons eu 42 étudiants qui se sont inscrits et qui ont travaillé toute la nuit du 7 pour présenter des projets et pour, euh, suite à leurs réflexions sur l'université du demain. Donc en gros c'était ça les défis, donc venir avec des idées et travailler ensemble, faire, faire des groupes multidisciplinaires pour proposer des idées euh, que nous pourrions accompagner euh, avec EDOC sous PPA pendant l'année en cours et voir qu'est-ce que ça donne à l'année prochaine. Donc on a eu vraiment beaucoup de très très bonnes idées. Hein. Et, et là, vous avez un tableau avec les quatre projets qui ont été retenus pour euh, être accompagnés. Donc un projet euh, qui, qui a... Là, vous voyez aussi les noms des, des porteurs, hein, des projets, les étudiants porteurs, euh, des différents campus, ça c'est très intéressant, des différentes euh, disciplines. Donc le premier projet qui consiste à, à mettre en place un groupe de parole sur tous les campus, campus afin d'accompagner les étudiants. Un deuxième qui vise plutôt à, à la création d'un foyer solidaire. Euh, sur les, pareil, hein, les projets sont euh, multicampus, l'idée c'est de les développer autour de, de tous les campus avec un frigo solidaire. Un projet euh, bi, biotop qui, qui, est, qui cible le développement de la biodiversité et le développement et la préservation de la biodiversité sous les différents euh, espaces verts, verts euh, du campus. Et finalement, à, à la création aussi d'un espace collaboratif intelligent et afin de et vraiment construire une communauté qui collabore entre les différents campus à partir principalement du numérique. Donc des projets très intéressants. D'autres projets aussi eh, qui seront euh, euh, soutenus aussi, des projets étudiants qui vont être soutenus par, par l'université, parce qu'il y a eu vraiment euh, beaucoup de bonnes idées, donc l'idée c'était de, de profiter de cette mobilisation eh, pour les soutenir. Donc là, euh, toute l'information va être disponible sur le site web de l'université, donc vous pouvez aller jeter un oeil donc, sur les différents, les différents projets avec des noms très accrocheurs aussi, très intéressants. D'accord <rire> Voilà, eh, voilà, voilà. Donc... Euh, et un autre élément important, aujourd'hui nous démarrons donc notre premier cycle de, de conférences et j'informe aussi que nous aurons euh, également euh, une conférence à la fin du mois, le 28 novembre, à 17h, ça va être à, à une conférence qui va avoir lieu à Pau et nous avons voulu commencer sur la Côte Basque cette, cette fois-ci, donc le prochain ça sera à Pau et il y aura aussi la possibilité de se connecter comme aujourd'hui par visioconférence depuis les autres campus. C'est une conférence sur le rôle du euh, carbon capture storage in the just transition to a low carbon economy par le professeur Raphaël Efron de l'Université d'Ondi de l'Écosse. Euh, C'est un porteur aussi d'une chaire en droit international et de l'énergie. Voilà, et il y aura aussi un événement qui, qui va avoir lieu le 28 novembre à Pau et le 12 décembre à Anglet. Et lié à, à ces, ces jeux Escape, Escape Game, lié à, à l'innovation, c'est dans le cadre de Jeudi Innova, c'est la deuxième édition. Donc vous êtes tous invités à, à participer, tout est disponible sur le site web de, de l'université en attendant la, la, la nouvelle version du site du projet de CS sous PPA. Donc on vous invite vraiment à les regarder et vous inscrire pour participer, tout le monde est bienvenu. Voilà, voilà. Donc, uh, then we have the pleasure then to start this first cycle of conference from the E2S UPPI project. And we are very pleasure to welcome our E2S UPPA uh, International Chair, uh, Professor um, uh, Kerry Mengerson. I suppose this is a good pronunciation. Uh, it was very difficult to me to prepare your introduction, Professor, because you have a very 
long CV and a lot of recognition, then I try to do a very short summary. Sorry for that. <laughs> then uh, Professor uh, uh, Mergenson comes from the uh, University, Queensland University of Technology, where she has the distinguished, distinguished sorry, professor position, a chair uh, position in statistics. Um, she's also a member from the ARC Center of Excellence of, for Mathematics, Mathematicals and Statistical front Frontiers from in, at Brisbane, uh, Australia. And she's also associate member of at the Oxford University and also a uh, laureate fellow at Australian Research Council. Uh, she also has a long, long experience uh, the direction, a member of the direction of the IRS Center of Excellence and amazing experience, international experience in research. I really, I need more time to do your proper introduction. <laughs> uh, then, talking a little bit about your expertise, uh, uh, we think that mm, your expertise, what, what is very interesting for us in this conference, is to talk about your uh, experience in statistic uh, models, computational algorithms and complex system modeling, Bayesian um, models. And you have also do, done a lot of very interesting projects with application in industry, business, and uh, health environment. This is also very interesting for us to, to, to see what you have done in this, in this domain. Then today your conference is uh, Merging Data Science and Citizen Science for Conservation of Threatened Species. And we're really um, w uh, pleasure uh, to c receive you today. And we're, we are sure we're really going to enjoy your conference. Thank you very much. So where I come from at the Queensland University of Technology, there are two research centres that I'm involved in. One is the, uh, the ARC, uh, hang on, no. Uh, one is the, uh, the ARC Centre of Excellence for Mathematical and Statistical Frontiers. And this involves seven universities over seven years. So we're about five years into this. And it brings together people in mathematics, statistics and machine learning to do uh, the methods and the theory and also to look at computation and applications in the areas of healthy people, sustainable environments and prosperous societies. So this is one research centre. And just this year, we've started a new centre, a centre for data science. And this is bringing together people from computer science and statistics and mathematics as uh, to create the core. And then we're, cr we're linking to all the different groups around the university that do work in data science. And so that's people in business, people in law, with ethics and trust and privacy, people in econometrics, people in social media research and so on. So that link is through the data science at QUT. And then we also have a link to the other centres around the country uh, that are working in data science as well. And that's through the Australian Data Science Network. So we have here um, a good environment for people working in the area of statistics and data science and linking to machine learning, to mathematics and to computer science. We all know that the world is now full of data. We have satellite data. Yeah? We have um, social media data. This picture here says that every minute of every day, this is the kind of activity that's happening in uh, social media. We have wearables. Who has a smartwatch here? Yeah? Smartwatches. So, so we have smartwatches. We have the Internet of Things, and, and there's a lot of connection in our, in our daily lives now through sensors uh, in our buildings, in our cars, on our own person, and so on. And all of this really adds up to big data. So we're in the world of big data. We have Internet 3.0, we have in Industry 4.0, Society 5.0, and the Internet of Things. And I think you could say anything like, you know, you could say chair 3.0 or, you know, glasses 1.0 or something, and there would be something going on in that area. So there's a lot of activity in this area of data, data coming from many different places. 
And we work in the area of big data, but also we can be in the area of little data, where even if we have a lot of data, we may not know about a particular thing very well. And even we may not even have a lot of data about that particular thing. So often for in ecology, we may not have a lot of information about a particular uh, problem that we're looking at. In fact, we may have no data. And in the area of little data or no data, then we need to say, well, we just don't know, or where else could we get this data from? Where else do we have information? Well, of course, there is a lot of information in the experts in the area. So how can we get the expertise from people and use that as information for our scientific study? And also there's a lot of information that people in the public can provide for a particular problem. How do we use that kind of information, that citizen science data? So often we have little or no data for threatened species. Threatened species are rare. When they're rare, we don't see them very often. And so we often don't have a lot of observed data. But experts have information and people can help us. So the kinds of problems that we've been looking at for threatened species are orangutans in Indonesia. We've been looking at cheetahs in Southern Africa, koalas in Australia, uh, jaguars in Southern um, America. We've been looking at the Great Barrier Reef as well and wallabies, rock wallabies. So these are some of the, the animals uh, that um, threatened species that we've been working with uh, all across the world. It's a great job being a statistician. You need to go where your data are. And so go to Indonesia for the orangutans and Africa for the cheetahs and Peru for the jaguars and Australia as well. So um, citizen science then is the kind of information that we try to make use of in these situations where we don't have a lot of data. And so citizen science can be seen as the collection and analysis of data relating to the natural world by members of the general public, typically as part of a collaborative project with professional scientists. Citizen, scientists, citizen science has a number of advantages. It can allow people to connect with science. It can increase their scientific understanding and it can help them, uh, they can help researchers to maximise the amount of data that's collected. Citizen science has become really popular. There are now citizen science committees, societies, communities. There are many papers now that are written on citizen science. Um, and there are many benefits, as I said. It can help overcome some of the limitations in conventional settings. It can contribute to reaching the sustainable development goals. And people are really contributing to large efforts in conservation. Some of these efforts, or two of them, are these ones. So we have the worldwide estimation of the abundance of birds. Does anybody here study birds or enjoy looking at birds? Go birding? Yeah? Yeah, so this is a big project about con uh, the contribution um, for birds. Um, the other project here is Snapshot Serengeti. So this is uh, where camera traps are set up in the Serengeti and in, uh, citizens are asked to go and identify the animals here. And that's used then to map or to understand um, the, the distribution of various animals. So there's different ways that people are engaged in uh, science. I'd like to tell you a few of the projects that we've been working on, and I've talked about the animals, but now let me tell you about the science that's behind what we're doing. So this is first the conservation of orangutans. So we have orangutans are um, typically in Indonesia. It's a terrible photo, but uh, t p figure. So this is Indonesia here, and this is Kalimantan and Borneo. So this was the area that we were focused on here in Indonesia. And um, 
there's a lot of threats for orangutans. There are threats for, um, here we have our uh, food, you know, they're stealing food, they've got human capture, they've got deforestation and so on. So big issues in terms of um, deal or, or threats to orangutans. If we want to know how many orangutans are around in a particular area, if we use regular science, we have to be able to count them. Now the forest is really dense, this is jungle. And also orangutans live in the top of the trees. So this is a drone photo of an orangutan's nest right up in the top of the trees. But they move around also. So counting the orangutans through the nests is really difficult as well. So instead of just using the regular science, we might ask the people. Why don't we ask the people? So this was a study that was done in Kalimantan, Indonesia. It was a survey of 700 villages, about 10 people per village, so 7,000 people. And questions were asked about, have you ever seen an orangutan? When did you see an orangutan? How many were there? Are there conflicts of orangutans in your area? Uh, what are the, uh, the features of the forest that are important to you, and so on. And we then were able to get environmental, social and demographic variables, and we were able to develop a statistical machine learning model to be able to predict different people's responses based on their social, demographic and environmental variables, and create spatial maps of those modelled responses. Now we did this not only for the orangutan presence and also conflict, but we also did it for uh, the value of the forest to the citizens. Now this was important because often it's only economic value that is used for decisions about deforestation. But if we can build social values, if we can build maps of the value, the value of the jungle for health, or the value of the jungle for culture, then those layers can also be considered when um, decisions are made about deforestation and so on. So these were some of the responses with respect to the um, why there was conflict. And um, this was just a small group of people uh, in this particular survey, but you can see it ranges from they're a, a pest, um, there's fear or self-defense, traditional medicine and so on. The um, reasons for the particular de uh, for possible decline in um, orangutans, you can see here, mining, hunting, fire, oil palm, which is a big problem, and logging. And what we wanted to do then was to be able to create a model to be able to predict those responses in areas that we hadn't actually surveyed. So we used a classification tree. And these are just very simple uh, um, like splits or, or decision trees. So if we have some X's here and we want to um, predict a response, let's just say it's a one or a two, whichever the categories are, then we take the, um, we look at just developing a tree so we can split the data on the X variables. So if X is greater than 80.5, X1 is greater than 80.5, will go this way and you'll get a 1. If it's less than it, you'll go this way. If it's x2 then is greater than 2.1, you go this way. Otherwise, you go this way. So a very simple sort of decision tree that ends up giving you a class. So if x1 is greater than 80.5, you're going to predict it to be a 1 and so on. So we can build these kinds of models um, in more complex ways, and we can see the kinds of variables that are important for being able to predict whether there's going to be conflict and what kind of conflict there'll be. Now, obviously, it depends on the environmental variables, the social variables, and the uh, um, other variables uh, in, the, the, in the survey. There's different extensions to those kinds of models, so we can build much more complex uh, prediction models, but that's the general idea. It's very simple models and then we, um, we can complicate them here. 
And when we do so, we get something like this. This is a classification and regression tree for killing orangutans. So you can see here, it depends on the village population as the biggest um, issue here. So if the village, so the village population is greater than 65% Muslim, um, then there will be a different kind of response compared to if it's um, less than 65% Muslim. And that's really because of the religious belief about eating orangutans. Okay, so it's a fair call. But then you can see that it relates to how much forest is in the area. We can see about schools. We can see about other land cover and so on. And if we follow the particular decision tree through, we can see the different kinds of reasons that people are giving for um, killing orangutans or, or conflict with orangutans. So then we can map this. And we can map this across the whole of the area to tell us about where are the important regions for conflict or where might we predict conflict to be. And then that can help us with management. So this is a particular way of using the citizen science through a survey type of data. The second kind of example is through conservation of cheetahs. So a different kind of model now and a different kind of um, data source we got from our citizens. So here's a cheetah in southern um, Africa. Uh, we went to South Africa, Botswana and Namibia. Cheetahs are extinct in 20 odd countries. The population was about 100,000 in 1900 to less than 8,000 today in the world. And there are many different factors that are involved in uh, whether cheetahs are going to succeed in the wild or uh, their, their, um, their, their human conflict as well. So the way that we decided to model this was through a Bayesian network. Now these kinds of models are saying what's the overall response and what are the factors that are related to that response? And then what are the factors that are related to those factors? And so you can build a conceptual model with all the kinds of factors that are important. So these kinds of things here can be built into this complex system. Once we've got that complex system, we don't just go, oh, nice, nice graph, nice picture, but we quantify it. And we quantify it by saying an easy way to do it would be to take each of the nodes and give them classes. So yes and no, normal or high, low, medium, high, depending on the factor. And then we quantify that. So we say, what's the probability of G being normal if its parents are yes and low, or yes and medium, or yes and high, and so on. So we get those probabilities. Now those probabilities can come from literature, or from previous studies, or from citizens, or from experts. And so what we did then was we got um, a, I had a four day workshop in Botswana. We had 12 experts in cheetah conservation and we took a structured approach to building one of these Bayesian networks. So we identified the target nodes, we listed the relevant factors that might influence those nodes, we agreed on the final set of factors and the relationships, and then we determined the states of the, the different factors, yes, no, high, low, and then we quantified it. And by doing that then, what we end up with is a Bayesian network for human cheetah conflict. So here we have the long-term conflict decrease and a short-term conflict decrease. We can see that these are affected by policy, farmer perceptions, economic benefits, conservation awareness. And you can see that they're affected by a number of factors themselves. Now each one of these can also be a network as well. So we can make a very complex system but show it in a more simple way. So some of the sub-networks, for example, are for farmer education, you know, you can have site visits or workshops 
mobile workshops or public education and public education breaks out into another network and so on. And then we quantify these. We see the same thing here, economic benefits, diversify, sustainable management, livestock production and so on. So we quantify this using the expertise of the 12 people and we could find these kinds of outcomes. So if our youth education is low, our government policy is absent and there is little chance of stopping short-term conflict, but there are high economic benefits to reducing long-term conflict, then there's a good chance of reducing human cheetah conflict. In other words, if everything is terrible for the orangutan short term, but there's good economic benefits long term, then there's a good chance that we can reduce the conflict long term. Okay? If the government policy is present, but all other factors are low, then we still can have a high probability of conflict in the long term. In other words, it's not just about government policy, it's got to be about people as well. So these are really important insights using these kinds of complex models. The third example, and there's five of these, so we're up to number three. The third example is conservation of the Great Barrier Reef. Who here is a diver? Uh, or, yeah? Okay, we've got, great, you can all be part of our citizen science uh, work. So we have here the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, we have the, the, um, the long-term monitoring. There is good scientific monitoring of the Great Barrier Reef at certain points along the reef. 20 years of monitoring. A lot of data at those points. But the Great Barrier Reef is 2,300 kilometres long. Okay? That's longer than the length of France. Okay? It's a long way. And so we just have tiny points where we've done the monitoring. What do we know about what happens in between those? How can we learn about that? Well, there's a lot of people out there with their cameras diving on the reef. All these people diving on the reef. And also there are people who are interested in the reef. What if we made a virtual reef online and we allowed people to put up their photos, their underwater photos, and then we can use machine learning to go into those photos, classify them, and then, uh, and then use that information for our uh, statistical models to be able to learn more about the health of the reef. And what if we, how do we make that machine learning? How do we know um, what's in those photos? We can use citizen science in that way as well. So we use citizen science in two ways. One, to get the photos, and the other, to annotate those photos, to go in themselves and say, is that coral, is that algae, is that sand? Okay? And then we can use their annotations in our statistical models as well. So what we've got then are two types of citizen scientists. We've got ones that can create, collect high quality data, um, either writing it, but typically by photos, and then an online citizen scientist. People can help to process the imagery and videos. And we can then have capacity for hundreds of thousands of people to undertake this um, to help us. So we've built this. This is called the Virtual Reef Diver. If you search for Virtual Reef Diver, you'll find it. And it's spatially enabling people to protect the Great Barrier Reef. So this is a web-based platform that allows groups to help monitor the Great Barrier Reef. We combine citizen contributed data with professional monitoring data. That enables us to increase the amount of information that we have. We can inform decision man management decisions and we can increase public awareness about the reef. So we have modelling, 
We have virtual reality, which I'll talk about next. We have a data workflow and a web interface. And it's, you can find it at reef, reefviz.stats.technology. For those who are um, interested in uh, diving, please help us. So what you get then is you go into a particular area, you can bring up an image, it has a QR code here, and you can then go into the image either just in 2D or in 3D, and then you see these little dots. And so you tell me, is this coral um, algae or sand? And then you annotate those, and then that goes into our model. So you can, these are the kinds of things you can select here, you have a little thing to tell you how many, um, you know, whether you've finished and so on. Uh, and then what we do is we use that information. We then make our estimates of coral cover here and then we can plot that. We can visualise that. And what we find is that this is what happens if we only use the monitoring data, the scientific data. This is the kind of representation that we get when we use the citizen data. We can find um, this is what happens if we just use the monitoring data. This is our observed versus predicted. This is what happens if we use all of the data, our observed versus predicted. We want the points, we want our observed values to be close to our predicted values. And you can see this is much better when we use all of the data than if we just use the science data. So what we learn then is we learn something about the coral um, cover over time. And coral cover is a good indicator of the reef health. And we see, for example, that there are very big differences between the behaviour of the reef on the inner reef, close to the shore, versus the outer reef, further out. So you can see a lot more dynamics in the outer reef. So when people talk about the health of the reef, it depends where you're looking. This is um, some of the impact. You can see here 2.7 million points, 180,000 images and so on. So a lot of activity and we need to keep this going. How accurate is citizen science may be a question that you're asking. You know, if anybody can go in and annotate these, how accurate is it? We might have people who are very good, who know what coral looks like. You might have other people, like me, who aren't very good at that. So the quality of the data produced by volunteers is often questioned in the science community. Contributors' commitment, abilities, training and effort, along with the difficulty of the task, can affect their performance. But we can use statistical methods to assess how well the users can perform the classification task and measure their latent ability. How good are they at classifying the images? And we can adjust then for that ability. And this can be done using item response theory. Item response theory says that you might classify it as yes or no for coral and it has some underlying probability of being coral or not. Okay, so imagine that this is flipping a coin. There's some probability of getting a head and you've declared it to be a head or a tail. That probability here of it being coral is going to be a function of the ability of the person, the difficulty of the task and how well you learn. Okay? Now this kind of model is used for education. So you think about students doing a test. Okay? If, they're, if they're doing a multiple choice test, um, then the, the ability of the student is going to, uh, the way that the student answers the questions will be, depends on their ability, plus the difficulty of the question, plus how much they're learning or whether they're guessing. Okay? So this kind of model is used very um, often in um, educational testing. But we can use it here in the same way for uh, the uh, citizen science. 
So if we look at that then, we can find the, in the accuracy of um, the individuals accounting for the type of images that they've actually identified and their latent ability. And similarly, we can look at how, um, how um, difficult each of the images are to classify. So each of the images then also gets an accuracy rating. So we're taking the data from the citizen science and we're going to understand what is the individual's ability and the difficulty of the images. And that helps us then to learn you know, how, um, how, which um, of our citizens are very good at doing the task and which of them we should just like, let them do it but then they should go home and watch television or something. Okay. Not so good. So that's the way that we can adjust for, um, for one source of quality in citizen science data. It's not the only cause and there's still a lot of work to do in how we can use this data effectively. The fourth area that I'd like to talk about is conservation of rock wallabies. So these rock wallabies are quite um, threatened in Australia. They live in this kind of terrain here. So um, it's very, very rocky because they're called rock wallabies. And this is the kind of area here in the Grampians in, in Victoria. Um, so you can see that it's very difficult for scientists even to get into these areas. So we're in a different situation now. We can't use citizens who are living with the rock wallabies because people don't live in this kind of area. We can't use our divers because there aren't going to be, there's no diving here, but also not so many people go into these areas. So the question is, how do we use citizen science in these very remote areas? Well, we can use virtual environments. Just as we built a virtual reef, we're going to build virtual environments for the rock wallabies. So this is an example of one of our first virtual environments. We found it's very hard to make rocks look like rocks for our rock wallabies, but we used this as a training exercise. We then made our, our virtual reality. So you can, um, who here has used virtual reality? Nobody with the virtual reality glasses? Yeah? Okay. All right, so if you go in with your virtual reality glasses, you are in the world, okay? So you can be transported to the Grampians. And in fact, we did an experiment where we put the, the glasses on, on people and put them um, uh, on here and we made the helicopter noise as if the person was going up into the rocks and then we flew them over the, the mountains and they could see the mount they could see it and they could go, I need to go in there, I want to go into that area and when they got closer it could zoom in to our virtual world. And then they could say, um, we would ask them, how likely is it that a rock wallaby would live there? And how sure are you about that? So if I get that kind of response from you for a particular site, Okay, then I know the characteristics of that site. And then you go to another site and give me an answer as well. And you go into the virtual world and go to a site and give me an answer. How likely is the rock wallaby to live there? And how sure are you? And I know the characteristics of that site. Okay, um, the, the, uh, the uh, vegetation, the type of rock, the aspect and so on. And similarly for other people. So if I gather that information, what I've got is a whole lot of responses. What's the probability of the rock wallaby to live there? And a whole lot of variables at those different sites. That's a data set. So I can build a statistical model based on the virtual reality responses. And by doing that then, we can get a suitability map um, for the area. And we can also find that site assessments using expert opinion contrast considerably with the habitat model. So we ask, well, is that a good contrast? 
or a bad contrast? Is the citizen science actually helping here? Well, one of the questions we could ask is, how well did we get that information out of the expert? Okay, We put them into this virtual world, we fly them over the, the, um, the uh, mountains, and then we ask them, how likely is it that an a, um, animal lives there? We need to do a very formal way of eliciting that information. So we need to train our experts beforehand. We need to elicit the information to get the information from the experts um, using a specific approach. So we ask them about the, the largest value and the smallest value, and then we ask them finally about the most plausible value. We record that, and then we can encode it in a distribution. So for example, this might be your probability of the animal being there. Okay? This one here might be somebody else's. So here are two probabilities given by two experts and then we can combine those. And the way that we get the information then is either on the relationships or as I said on the responses. It's just some information. We can combine the information from the different experts in a number of ways. We can either um, put every, all the experts into a room and make them agree. That's the Delphi method. We can average the, um, the expert opinion. Or we can build a mixture model that um, will combine the information. This is some, um, I, some representations of the different uh, experts. So here is the mean and the variance given for a, um, a, a when we modelled it as a normal distribution. And you can see here this is the uh, for each expert their mean and their variance here in terms of the uncertainty around those particular estimates. So we're combining this information. When we combine this then what we end up with is a good estimate of the, um, the probability of the animal being in that particular place. So that was our trial run. We tried to make these virtual environments. But it's difficult. It's difficult to make rocks look like rocks because experts want rocks to look like real rocks. Okay, And so who knew that you had to go to so much trouble to make a rock? So we said, well, that's fine. But what if we actually took, instead of making virtual, in like digital environments, we take the real environment. So the last example I want to talk about is conservation of jaguars. And this is in Southern um, America in Peru. So the idea here was the, the, the conservation fund that we were working with wanted to make a corridor, a safe passage for the jaguars through the Amazon in Peru. We got together a research team uh, you can see the list of people here that came from media, maths, statistics, machine learning and visualisation. And we wanted to um, create this Peruvian um, um, Amazon conservation corridor. We wanted to merge our virtual reality with drones and bioacoustics and camera traps and smartphones with statistical modelling and we wanted to better engage our local and international experts in conservation. Now I do statistics, right? Um, and next thing, I'm finding myself in the Amazon with my virtual reality cameras or my 360 cameras, learning to fly a drone, sticking cameras, uh, camera traps out and putting um, videos, um, GoPros on a plane and so on. So it was a an interesting experience um, to do this kind of work. We went to two locations. We went to uh, Emiria, which is a reserve, and Pacaya Samiria in the northern part of Peru. And I'll just show you some holiday snaps. So this is um, Emiria. You can see around a lake here and the Shipibo people who were our hosts and our informants. And Pacaya Samiria is a big um, river with prime jungle on either side. Here we are fishing for piranha here. Um, this is fishing for piranha is great. You just have to dangle a bit of meat in the water and you get a fish, so it's really easy. And then you pass it to the local person who then takes the fish off the line because 
they've got big teeth. Um, and then somebody cooks them, so they're very nice. This is how much data we had. Okay, there's not much known about jaguars in the deep Amazon here, but we have local people who know about it, citizens, and we also have our experts. So we asked our local people to tell us your stories. We tried to do the formal elicitation that I showed you. They weren't interested. So we said instead, tell us your stories. Where did you see jaguars? Just like we did with the orangutans. And tell us on a map where it was. I saw a jaguar fighting with a giant anteater and the anteater was on its back with the legs in the air. The great stories. Put a star on the map where you saw it. Easy for us to say, if you've never seen a map, it's more difficult. Okay. So we wanted then to talk to the experts, but we can't take the experts to the jungle, but we can take the jungle to the experts through virtual reality. So we took our 360 photos in the jungle, we made virtual reality photos and then, uh, or environments, and then we asked, elicited the information as I showed you before. What's the probability of a jaguar living at this location um, and how sure are you about it? So here we are with our 360 cameras. Um, the, we made a, um, a 3D uh, we 3D printed a cover for our camera here. Um, this is our guide here, um, who was more interested in looking at the virtual world instead of guiding us. Here, with our very, well, we took very different sort of 360 cameras. I was allowed to use this one because it was just like a little remote control. Others used the more, um, the more detailed ones. And we built these virtual environments. So if you search for a project, or I'm happy to give you the site online, you can see the, um, the, the virtual reality worlds um, that we, we took. So we wanted to ask our experts here. And then we wanted to, as, we, as I told you, and what we did then was we combined local and expert information. We created an input variable or layer in the model and combined it with other input variables. We also looked at Bayesian approaches and we can also calibrate those models using a data-based approach. So the kinds of statistical models where the citizen science meets the data science came in a spatial model of jaguar encounters like the orangutan model, a Markov model of jaguar movements a Bayesian network, like I showed you before for the, uh, for the cheetahs um, on key factors and impacts and Bayesian models using data. So we had some spatial models here. We had some stochastic models. So anybody who does sort of uh, applied maths kind of um, stochastic modeling would see these kinds of uh, models. What's over time? What's the probability of a jaguar? Um, cra the population crashing or decreasing, and our Bayesian network. So this is the kind of Bayesian network that I showed you before. So what's the viability of jaguars in the wild was impacted on by human impact, prey insecurity, and habitat loss, which had all of the other factors as well. So why was this important for us? Well, for the Conservation Foundation, this was a new way to estimate jaguar abundance and to, to put that into their efforts to build a jaguar corridor. For us, it was new ways to combine new technology and maths and stats. And we believe it was really important to start doing this work because it can feed into global climate change reports and sustainable development goals. So this is um, the team, some of the team who went to Imeria. Um, I'd like to um, end then by thanking my collaborators. And if I go back to this picture here, you know, this is our, our excursions into this area with conservation. So um, we've got, we, we use big data, we do the kinds of statistical modeling and analysis using big data. But in many cases, we only have small data. 
and in some cases we have no data. So what we want to do then is to be able to use other sources of information and a really important source is our experts and the public. So we can use, we can try to use the information from our experts and our public but there are different ways that we can get that information and we've been trying to experiment with some of these ways and then there are different ways we can use that information in our statistical models. We can build decision trees, we can build Bayesian networks, we can map the information. Okay, different ways that we might um, uh, statistically model that information and then be able to provide it for conservation managers and individuals back again so that they understand and engage with the science. In fact, for our virtual reef diver project, the other kind of citizen science that we've been doing is making a game. So, I know it's not very scientific, but it's a great um, way of engaging the public. We have a card game here with, um, our, for our virtual reef diver. So if anybody wants to play a game or have a look at that, um, then you're very welcome to later. So then that brings me to the end of the, uh, the talk. There is a lot of work, a lot of energy in the use of citizen science data. I showed you some of the ways that we can um, account for some of the problems like the accuracy of the, um, the citizens and, uh, and also combining, uh, eliciting the information and combining it. But there are many other research challenges. So it brings together people in maths, statistics, computer science, ecology and social science. It's a great area to work in. If any of you are interested then I'll be very happy to talk to you uh, later about it or come and visit us in one of our research centres at QUT in Australia. So I'd like to acknowledge our collaborators uh, or my collaborators. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that many of the images in this talk have been stolen from the, uh, the internet uh, including this one here which I really like. And, uh, and here are some references, I've, these are in the slides which I think are going to be available. Um, you're welcome to them and that brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you. Uh, we're going to start from here. Yes, well. Thanks. Make okay, well, what do you do when you can uh, find some people having a bad level of accuracy? So there's two things that we, we've been doing and uh, we would like some other input. But the first is when we have many people, we can, um, we have been only using the people who have a high level of accuracy. You have to uh, make a choice. Yeah, so you have to make a choice. But the other thing we can do too is train people. So people who, uh, for example, in the diving community, there's often the boat that goes out. And people are interested in taking good photos or people are interested in learning about um, you know, coral and, 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 um, and being able to classify for us. So we can use that. So we've got people involved with the dive clubs to make learning material and hopefully then that will improve their accuracy. And could you correct the data, uh, yeah. putting some weight or um, I don't know exactly how to do that bit? Yeah, so what we've done um, in, in the way that we've, we've been weighting the, um, the information that comes in, so we, we take away all our uh, and p people who are really bad <laughs> and then amongst the others we can weight their uh, their responses. So when I make a, an average, then I will weight it by their accuracy. Like a co confidence uh, coefficient. Yeah, like a confidence, or you think of it like a um, a likelihood weight that you might put on it. You know, so you've got y to the w sort yeah, of thanks. weight. Yeah. Yeah. Another question? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, the English, but um, I think for the photos, 
is uh, really easy to check for the accuracy of people, but uh, when you can check it, do you take it into account, uh, I don't know how, or just you say uh, it's good or not? Uh, I don't yeah, so uh, in the elicitation, so when we ask people, we do part of the structured approach is we ask them some questions beforehand where we know the answers. So we show everybody the same um, images and we know the answers for them. So then we can get an, um, an estimate of how good the person is based on those um, um, that, um, images. Uh, and also then during the process we will include an image that we know the answer to and then we can see whether they're learning or changing as the process goes on. But um, for some areas where we don't know the answers, the other thing we can try to do is to say, well, we can look at what the everybody else is saying as well. So if, for example, most people are classifying this area as coral and you're classifying it as sand, then either you're an expert and they're not, or we take the, 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 the um, mode, like the, the most common value. Yeah. Yes, but um, for example, uh, in the Jaguar study, mm. um, even the people uh, said I'm um, sure 100% uh, that I saw a Jaguar here. Uh, you, you are not sure th that is true. So how can you deal uh, with this problem when you can't uh, verify the answer? Yeah, that's true. So we don't know. Um, uh, it was interesting in the Jaguar study because we had everybody, um, like all of the village there. So uh, if we're asking about from, ex there's two groups, there's the experts and the local people. If we're asking the local people, then there was a group of local people. So for example, one man said, I saw 10 jaguars there and everybody laughed. Mm. So they were saying, no, no, no. And somebody would say, I saw a jaguar here, but then they would go, they'd do a lot of talking in Shipibo. And so, and so then it would come back through Spanish and then to English and would say, well, it was actually not here, it was over here. And so they would sort of correct each other. So in that situation, that was good. For experts then, we can, um, a, we have developed, for example, a, a Bayesian network to see how reliable our experts might be and what are the features of being a good expert. But typically, you trust you know, for that. Thank you. Yes, uh, was a question? Yes, uh, yes uh, perhaps examples that you could give to us about for the decision, decision making? making of this kind of model. Sure, so um, for the um, for the cheetah example where we were looking at uh, the conflict, uh, sorry, th with the orangutans where we were looking at conflict with the orangutans, um, and also with the cheetahs. Um, um, what's an example? So with the, with the cheetahs one, when we did this Bayesian network and we were looking at the, uh, the human cheetah conflict, what happened was that the, because we had a group of people in the room that involved both the government people and the, uh, the ecologists, and the biologists. It was interesting because before there hadn't been, every time there had been some discussion um, uh, from the ecologists and the government people, there had been uh, an, an argument. But because we had made, like, made this network model and different people could see their um, part of the, the work in that model, then people began to talk about the different kinds of aspects. And so that really made a difference to um, 
to how they then talked to each other. It was no longer an argument. It was more about um, the whole problem, the whole system. So um, we don't, I don't have any with the the cheetah. Ex sorry, with the jaguar example. What can, has come out of that is that there has been different areas that have been designated for the Jaguar Corridor. So we took our results to the government and we showed the government people the, um, the virtual reality and we then showed them like what we'd, what we, where the areas that we had marked and they have allocated some of those areas for reserves for the Jaguars. So we think that's a success. It hasn't made the whole corridor but there's some examples. I, I, I have a question, perhaps, yes, uh, uh, about, you know, uh, this is, uh, I, I was thinking on about another uh, very uh, successful case, for example, Wikipedia. Mm. Wikipedia is based on, you know, citizen, I mean, sometimes experts, sometimes mm. anyone that would like to talk about something in a city or a, a city, a school or a, a problem or a solution, etc. And they are uh, working together, and uh, I was wondering about the reliability of this uh, data that we are collecting. Uh, compared with, for example, for with Wikipedia, we know that it's very high, high accurate, mm -hmm. highly ar accurate, because it's automatically being uh, corrected by people mm. when they are like uh, participating collectively. Mm. In this kind of uh, uh, works, uh, how uh, people can get the global view of the data, uh, how they could perhaps modify the, the, the information of the data that is provided. Yeah, so in the, uh, in the coral reef example, in our virtual reef diver, then uh, we find that we find that a lot of people um, will look at, because we have beside the virtual reef, we have the, the modeled predictions and, um, and they see where there are areas that they, you know, may, they might know about. And so then they will have a look at those images, and uh, you know there will be some discussion about it as well, and then some reannotation. So it's very early days for this. I think w I think that uh, it, the self correction or the group correction works really well when there's a lot of um, a lot of people to do that kind of correction. But um, but otherwise, it's you know, we're just learning how to do it. I have another question. How do you know which kind of mathematical model is the most relevant in your data analysis? Yes, good <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, I think if um, we try to start with uh, the more simple models, so we might start with a, uh, you know, a prediction model, but often even if you take a, a regression, for example, then you still need to add in the uncertainty of the responses. Um, and so, so the regression model becomes more complex even at that point. And then the machine learning methods, if we have a response and we have some more quantitative variables that we can see would lead into a kind of decision tree, they're very popular, we use those a lot. If it's more complex um, uh, system, and also we have data from different sources. So then the Bayesian network uh, is more um, applicable because uh, we can have many nodes connected to other nodes and we different factors will influence other factors. And the information can be used from different sources for parts of the problem. So if we only have um, some information that tells us about human factors, and some other information that tells us about ecological factors, then we can't build one of the sort of usual machine learning models because we don't have all of the information on all of the, um, the responses or all of the, we don't have a full set of information. So the Bayesian network models become useful then. So we have, you know, we have a few models that we've been trialing uh, and they sort of fit with these different situations. Uh, um, I, I, I was thinking about, about also uh, semantic models. I don't know if you, yes, you mm -hmm. because uh, in computer science we are usually using, for example, ontologies mm, yeah. uh, in order to ex uh, semantically express in a formal way the expert, expert knowledge. Yeah. And then we are mapping from text mining, you know, to go to the expert. Yeah. expert. 
how we could use this? I mean, perhaps you are using that, that yeah. kind of model in your work. No, but it's really interesting. We're not at the moment, but, um, but I think that it's a really interesting uh, approach. So in our new Centre for Data Science, we have people who do a lot of um, text mining and semantic analysis, and we're really looking forward to connecting with them. So we don't do so much. We at the moment, this is based on th we, we quantify that kind of information and we put it into our models, but otherwise we're not using it very well. So it's a rich area for research. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Another question. Social network. What social network platform, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, WhatsApp, Snapchat, would you use to obtain data out from citizens? Yeah, so uh, we haven't used the... <laughs> oh, that's your question. Ah, oh, thank you. Um, we haven't used the social network platforms yet for this, but I know that there's a lot of work, for example, on analysing Twitter um, data. So it's our so we have a social media research centre, and they have a large um, Twitter account um, that they do. They do the analysis of Twitter data. Um, so the the this you know there's a lot of work in looking at um, these social network sites and trying to extract the kind of information, um, overall summaries, different kinds of um, uh, you know, topics that are being discussed and so on, and the networks between the different people, of course. So that kind of information um, is being extracted. We haven't used that yet for um, in our sorts of modelling, but um, it's an interesting area. So yeah. Are you using it? You are? Do you, want to, do you want to explain? Do you want to tell me? Well, I'm, well, I'm using Facebook, for example, a yeah. uh, link to WhatsApp to track the um, oops, to track the invasion of uh, blue crab. It's a uh, Calinectes sapidus. It's a uh, alien species which uh, arrived to the Western Mediterranean in like mm, 2014, something like that, and it's taken over all the coast. It's nearly in Montpellier now. And then it's uh, it's reaching Faro in uh, Portugal, so I'm uh, I'm using a Facebook profile, in which I'm posting photos and um, documents about this uh, this crab, and also I'm using a um, Google form to ask uh, people about uh, age, uh, gender, uh, from how long they have been fishing, uh, like like fishing expertise. So. If there's somebody which is fishing from like uh, one year ago, it's like okay, it's like an index to to tune yeah. the the weight of the response. And uh, yeah, if they have seen the blue crab in which habitats uh, and all this, I'm asking them also to upload a upload a photo of the blue crab with the, an euro on the on the carapace, so we can estimate the size as well, or I can estimate the size of the of the crab. So we see if there are little worms. So that means that there are population established already in there or not. So, yeah. yeah oh, very interesting. <coughs> That's very good. That's a really nice example. Mm. Thank you. Yep. Another study that um, that uh, so we were there's these uh, Eureka Awards and uh, we had our virtual reef diver um, nominated uh, in the finals for it, um, and this frog citizen science project beat us. So this was a. A, um, a an app on your phone and you record the sound of the frogs and then send the the frog sounds in and it's actually been used to find like lots of different frogs that they thought uh, didn't exist in particular areas and uh, you know being able to map frogs across Australia so it's really and they've got school kids doing it so it's great that's great uh, any more questions from Paul Nothing else. Then Hello. yes. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Kerry, for this interesting and clear uh, presentation. And we apparently we do not have any other question here in Paul. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Kerry, for your presentation. Um, I hope that this is just the beginning. I mean, the continuous of your yeah. current project with the with the university and the ETS project, and perhaps new trends for future collaborations. Thank you very much. Thank okay? you. Thank <laughs> you, everybody.